This morning, uh, my uh, talk title is God Works Even in the Midst of Silence. God Works Even in the Midst of Silence. There are times when we decide to be silent to one another. Usually that happens when we have some arguments with somebody. That happens in family, that happens in my family. You know, a husband and wife, they don't talk to one another, they avoid uh, eye contact, and uh, they don't want to be in the same place, same room. You know, it happens in, 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 in many families. And at work, it happens. Maybe you have an argument, you have disagreement with your colleague, and you avoid in the corridor, uh, you don't want to sit next to each other. And it happens in the neighborhood, maybe you had a, you know, some kind of argument over the fence or something, noise, uh, so you don't talk to uh, neighbors. And that happens even in church. Uh, we don't talk to one another sometimes uh, and, and, and not try to be uh, near fine. So as humans, you know, we know that happens in our lives. But wonderful thing is, when that is restored, when we forgive one another, when we accept one another, when we are reconciled to one another, that's fantastic. Too. And, and, and that happens too. Uh, after some argument, after some you know, silence, then we are reconciled. We come back together. So that's that's fantastic. I remember once, that's many, many years ago, I, I was in my 20s, so I was very much immature. And uh, uh, we, we, had a, we had a mission center in, in, in King's Cross. And uh, we, we had to share, we had to share this, uh, this place. I, I think there were about three, four single uh, assistant pastors. I was one of those. And then there was, uh, there was a guy who was taller than me and who was older than me. And I just didn't like him. Uh, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was a very, very much prayerful person and uh, he was really passionate about evangelism. Uh, but he was very stubborn. He was very stubborn. And I'm sure, you know, he, he didn't like the things that I did, but I didn't like the things that he did. So we didn't really get on uh, each other very well. So I, you know, I, I just didn't like this, uh, this person uh, for, for a long time, you know, for a long time. Okay, we didn't, we didn't really uh, uh, talking, talking to, uh, uh, talk to one another. Okay, uh, but then thankfully later it was it was restored. We, we you know we opened our hearts, uh, we shared our thoughts, and so it was it was reconciled, which was fantastic. Okay, so even in ministry that can happen. You, you decide to be silent, uh, not talking to a particular person or a group of uh, people. Sometimes God decides to be silent toward us as well. There's a verse in the Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 7, it says, A time to tear, a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak. So as God says, there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. Now, that can apply to God himself as well. So sometimes God decides to be silent. And we all experience that from time to time. I experience it many times. Okay. You know, you know God, God just God is quiet. God doesn't speak to you. God doesn't God doesn't say anything. Very silent. You you desperate to hear from God and you, you want God to speak to you, give you some kind of direction, encouragement, and hope. But for some reason, God decides to be silent. So He said, "There's a time to be silent and a time to uh, speak." Now we are reading in Job chapter chapter twenty uh, forty two. We're reading uh, a story about Job. Uh, God's apparent and long silence was in Job's life. You can actually, you can actually check this as you flick through the pages of uh, Job. Okay, and just, you know, just just skimming through the headings of each chapter, we see in chapter one and chapter two uh, the suffering, the immense suffering uh, in Job's life begins, and then toward the end of chapter uh, chapter two, Job's three friends appear, you know, one by one, uh, a friend called Eliphaz. Uh, Bildad, Zophar. So they, they come one by one and they, they speak to Job. They try to encourage Job. They, they try to share what they think and how this suffering happened in Job's life. So the pattern is Eliphaz and Job, Bildad and Job, Zophar and Job. So that's how, how it continues from chapter 3 all the way through to chapter 31. In all those, in all those chapters, when this conversation between Job and his friends is going on, there's nothing from God. God is absolutely quiet, silence, no words whatsoever 
from God, muted, very much muted from God. And in chapter 3, there's another guy, another friend comes along, his name is Elihu, and he speaks long, you know, uh, 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 words to, to Job. And that goes up to chapter 37, near the end of the book of Job. And yet, no word, no word from God whatsoever. Okay? So it's, it's like your God spoke at the beginning of the book, chapter 1 and chapter 2, and then decided to be silent, absolutely silent, all the way up to chapter 37, near the end of the book. Now, I can, I can imagine that, that that really made Job's life really hard, okay? Uh, you, know, you, you, know, you, you know, we know that the, uh, Job was really going through hardship and suffering of all kinds, but God was silent. Job's friends came and speaking, you know, speaking to Job, you know, this and that. God was silent. Uh, Elihu come and he, he says long, long words, long words to Job, but God was silent. It was only in chapter 38, God begins to speak. There's a heading in NIV, it says, the Lord speaks. He finally speaks. Now, just imagine that, okay? Now, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, what, what, what Job desperately needs at this point is just hear from God. Because yes, it's good you have friends come along and, you know, talking to you and trying to encourage you, but sometimes they don't understand. You know, they only see from their point of view. Okay, so no one really understands. You know, four friends, well-meaning, all good. They, they come from long distance, so they, they really try to help uh, Job. So they, they well-meaning. But Job finds it rather discouraging. Because in a way, they are, they are like accusing Job. You know, you, you must have something wrong. You must have something wrong. That's why all these terrible things happen. Okay? Otherwise, God wouldn't allow these, thing, these things to happen to your life. So, you know, you better repent. You better reflect on your life. But Job said, no, no, I, I, I haven't done that. I didn't do anything wrong. I don't understand why these things are happening. So, you know, their, their lack of understanding made their, their counsel uh, you know, their conversation really even more hurtful uh, to, to Job. And their assumption, you know, their assumption, uh, thinking that, you know, Job has done something wrong. Job might have seen, uh, you know, something, okay? So that's really, that's, that makes Job's situation even more hurtful. I'm sure you've been to that kind of situation where people, you know, they, they, they want to encourage you, they want to speak to you, uh, you know, so they want to talk to you, uh, and they want to give you a bit of advice and counsel, counseling, but that's not really helpful, okay? Because because of their lack of uh, lack of understanding, they don't really understand what what's going on in your life and in your heart. So it ends up being even more hurtful and discouraging, okay? And that's what Job finds. And so the most difficult part for Job must be the absolute silence. Of God, all those times, all those chapters, God was silent. Okay, and uh, you know, in Job, Job lost all his business, all his property, all his servants, all his flocks. Chapter one, verse thirteen, he says, "One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and they were drinking wines uh, at the only brother's house, but all of a sudden, uh, you know, the, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were grazing, but then the uh, surveillance." The enemy, the attack, and they made off with them, and they put the servant to the soul. Okay. So one day he lost his oxen, he lost his donkeys, and then it goes on. The fire of God fell from heaven, and it burned everything, the sheep, the servant, they all burned down, they all killed. Uh, and then it goes on, uh, the, you know, the Chaldeans came, and they, they killed the servant. Okay. So all of a sudden, just one day, one after the other, he lost everything, all the property, all the possession. All the flocks, and then even even worse, he lost all his children. Now the messenger came and says, "Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine uh, at, at the older older eldest brother's house, but then suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, and it collapsed on them, and they are dead instantly." Okay. Uh, all of a sudden, this desert storm came and just just hit the house. And, and the roof collapsed and everyone killed. Now just pause for a moment and imagine that, okay? 
I was reading this uh, this news uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, and this was this was really a freak thing, a freak accident. Uh, a mom was driving a car with her children. I think it was two two children on board. And then suddenly, as, as she was driving, suddenly you know, a, a, a spider dropped on her on her head, and she was you know, she was like, you know, uh, really frightened uh, by that. Okay, and, and as she was uh, reacting you know, like that, she lost control. Okay, she lost control. She lost sight. She lost control, and car collided into something so terribly, the children got killed. You know, the mom was the mom, the mom survived, but children got killed because of this freak accident. You know, spider, little spider. Okay, and she was frightened. And that it was all very much freak accidents, and then you lost your children, two of them. Terrible, terrible news. Okay, so just imagine how Job must have felt. You know, all of a sudden this this stone from the desert came and, and just hit the house, and the roof collapsed, and all the children, uh, not one, but all of them, uh, died all at the same, gone all at the same time. And then in chapter 2, it goes on to say that Job had this painful source from the top, top of the head to the uh, you know, sole of the feet, completely covered with this skin uh, problem. And he had this pieces of pottery, broken pottery, and just scraped uh, himself because it's so itching. Okay? And it goes on to say, even his wife said to him, uh, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. You know, just go and kill yourself. And, you know, it's not worth living anymore. So it seems like uh, his wife disappeared because we can't find her anymore in the remaining chapters of the book. So that was the kind of situation uh, that Job was in. This is unimaginable, unbearable suffering. And uh, you know, we, we also experience hardships and suffering from time to time in our life. But compared to Job, what we, what we go through, it, you know, it, you know, you, you know it's, it, it is an entirely different level uh, what Job is experiencing here. So what he really needs in this situation is to hear from God, to, to try to understand why all these things happen. You know, so really seeking out God, why? Why do you allow these things? Why, why are these things happening? You know, God speak to me, uh, tell me, talk to me. So he, he was really desperate to hear from God, but for some reason God decides to be silent, switch off, no voice, uh, nothing. Now, when you, um, you know, in our church, we did the, the, the quiet time for a few years, the living life quiet time for a few years. And, uh, you know, when, when, when you do a quiet time, devotional reading, you like God to speak to you. When maybe you're reading Psalm, and as you meditate, as you read a few times, and uh, try to reflect on, on that, you, know, you like to sense that God is speaking to you through, through the passage, okay? And, you know, if not every day, maybe, maybe twice or three times a, a, a week, so you can carry on into the next week. And the altar, because you find that God is speaking to you. But imagine that you know you get nothing, you get nothing. You know all the way through Psalms and all the way through you know other 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 books of the Bible, you get nothing for weeks and months. And it will be very hard if that happens. It will be very hard to continue because it seems like God is not speaking to you, and uh, it feels like there's no point reading the Scripture if God doesn't speak. So for Job. It must be really difficult, perhaps the most difficult part in his in his life. And then the Bible said Job was actually he was a blameless and upright. He feared God and shone evil. He was a godly man. He worshipped God. He loved God. He, he was obedient uh, to God. But then you know God for some reason decides not to speak. So this is a this is a situation. This is a background. But then when we read Job, uh, Job chapter 42, the last chapter, uh, God finally speaks okay, from 38, 39, and then God finally speaks to Job. And Job says this in verse 1, 42 verse 1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted." Okay. So Job says, you can do all things. None of your purpose can be thwarted. Okay, in other words, Job realized, God, you can, you can still work even in the midst of darkness, even in the midst of silence. I realize now you can work. Okay, that's Job's experience. Job thought, you know, God was indifferent. 
And the God wasn't interested. God was silent. God was quiet. God, you know, God isn't talking. But then, when it came to the last chapter, toward the end, Job realized God still works in the midst of silence. Okay? And uh, uh, because God is the almighty God. He is the all-knowing God. Another translation said, there is nothing you cannot do. He may be silent, but he can still work in our lives. He can still work in your life. Okay? So that's the really key point uh, for us uh, this morning. So how does God work in the silence? Well, we, we, you know, we have a few things that we can, we can, uh, we can point out uh, in this passage. The first thing is this. God decides the boundary of hardship. God decides the boundary of hardship. You may find this very difficult to understand, but God actually decided the boundary of hardship in Job's life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Okay, that is very clear there. God, God will not let you be tempted or suffer beyond what you can bear. In other words, God will design a boundary. Okay. So, so you know, so I know, I know, you, know, you, you can, you can, take, you can endure, and you, know, you can, you can, you can, you can just, you know, you know be patient and endure uh, so far. But I know if you go further beyond this, it will just destroy you. You will just collapse. Okay. So this is the boundary of the hardship. God decides the boundary of hardship. Through hardship, some people are getting stronger. You know, we experience that. But then others, they are destroyed. They just give up altogether. They give up on God. They find it so hard to believe a good God as they're experiencing hardship. Okay, so God knows uh, you know, who we are, uh, you know, how strong, how weak we are. We are like clay jars. We are like clay pots. We're easily broken. So God doesn't want to destroy us. God doesn't want to uh, you know, uh, let us collapse. So he decides the boundary, okay? Boundary of hardship. We sing the song, he knows my name, he knows every thought, he knows every detail in our lives. And that's what happens in Job. You know, you, you feel like a Job, uh, to, to Job is like just, just long suffering to him, but God was actually very careful, okay? Luke chapter one, verse eight, it says, when, when, Satan, you know, when, when God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Uh, and then Satan says in verse 9, Have we not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? God, yes, obviously, because you have, you have put a hedge, a protection, a hedge around him and his household and everything he has. Okay, so Satan recognizes God has, God has a boundary, God has protection, God has hedge around him. And then, and then the, you know, Satan said, you, you know, you know, Just let me, let, me, let me stretch my hand and just strike him. Okay? And then he will, he, will, he will curse you and he will, he will give up uh, on you. And so God said, okay, very well then. Everything he has is in your hands. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. So God allowed Satan to have a go uh, at Job, okay? To give some, you know, a bit of su uh, suffering and hardship. But God made it very clear. But on the man himself, on the Job himself, I don't want you to lay a finger. Is that clear? And said, "All right." So he went. Okay. So Job, God put a boundary uh, of hardship around him. And then again in chapter chapter two, uh, you know, the Satan failed, and he came and he, he he says to God, "Stretch out your hand and strike the flesh and bones." This time, just strike him. Uh, head on. And then he will curse you, and he you know curse you to your face. And God says, "Very well, then. He is in your hand, but you must not. You must spare his life." Okay. So again. I said, all right, have a go, have a go. So he's in your hand, but you must spare his life. Don't touch his life. That's the boundary. Okay. So, you know, it seems it's just overblown, uh, completely out of, you know, out of, uh, out of order, uh, suffering and hardship. But God was actually very careful to put the limit, to put the boundary, okay? Because he, know, he knows how strong and how weak we are. Obviously, in our hardship, there's a purpose. You know, one of them is to discipline us, to strengthen us. Uh, you know, just in athletic, you know, athletics, you can't, you can't train, you can't grow, you, can't, you cannot get stronger without discipline. Okay? So it takes hardship, it takes discipline. 
Uh, but God knows who you are. And God sets the boundary and the limit. And even in chapter 38, uh, uh, he says, uh, Who shut up the sea behind the doors? And 10, chapter 10, When I fix the limits for it, and set its doors and bars in place. In other words, God says, uh, you know, the, 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 the sea, the waves, okay? You know, sometimes in stormy weather, we, we see the wave just coming and just pouncing on the houses, pouncing on the road and cars, and that's scary. And you, you, you think that's just like a complete out of control. No, the, God, the, uh, the Bible says, God actually fixed the limits for you, okay? Now, if you have an out of control situation, it is called tsunami, and everyone will be in danger, okay? But God actually fixed the limits for the waves and the seas so that the water can come, you know, so far, but no more, no, not beyond, okay? So even the waves in the ocean, uh, it's, not just, it's not just by accident. God has limit, God has boundary because God wants to protect us. Uh, God loves us. God cares for us. And as I was reading this passage, I was reminded of, uh, of you know, of, of, of what I was trying to do as a dad. Uh, you know, my, now my kids are rather, rather, you know, they, they big and uh, they the, the second school. But uh, when, when, when they were young, when they were small, I remember taking them to playground, rocker playground, small, you know, slide and swings, and they, they would just enjoy. So, but, but as a dad, I would sit on bench, but watch very carefully. Okay, two years, three years, very you know, small, small children playing, and I, I will watch very carefully uh, in case a dog comes in, or maybe big boys coming and just taking taking the slide or swing. So I will watch very carefully. Oh, maybe they fall from the uh, uh, slide. I will, I will sit, but I will be ready at you know all the time. Okay, so whatever happens, I will just jump in and step in, and that was that was that was that was me, and that, that that's what we do as parents. And that's not what God is like. Uh, he, will, he will allow some, some hardships and sufferings and difficult times uh, uh, for his good purpose. But then he's always ready. And he puts the boundary, he puts the limit uh, because he knows uh, who we are. So God, uh, God decides the boundary of hardship. And then secondly, what we see here is God works for the good using good and bad. God works for the good in our lives using good and bad. It says in 37, uh, chapter 37, verse 25, who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm. Okay. Now, you know, last week we had a, we had a very hot weather for a few days, and then we had a uh, we had a, we had this rain, and sometimes you know the, the thunder, lightning and thunder. Okay, and then you wonder that's that's just like you know just just happens the thunder the lightning okay here and there, but the Bible says who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain, the rain will come exactly as God allows, and the path for the thunderstorm okay the thunderstorm there's a path, God God allowed God made path for the thund uh, thunderstorm and the lightning is not just you know, happening uh, here and there. God has planned, God has path for the lightning, thunder, lightning, rain, and all those things. We may think that's a freak weather, freak accident. Okay. But everything was carefully under the control of God, under the watchful eye of God. Even the rains, even the lightning, all those things uh, under God's control. God is in charge. Okay. So God works for the good using good and bad. Now in Deuteronomy, when the Israelites arrived on the eastern side of Jordan, and they just waiting to cross the Jordan River, and Joshua is preparing himself as a new leader, and, and, and Moses is giving giving uh, you know, sermons, messages to prepare uh, these people to cross the Jordan River, and Moses said this, Deuteronomy chapter eleven verse ten: "The land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt, from which you have come, where you planted your seed and irrigated it." By food, by foot, as in a vegetable garden. Okay, he's saying now the land you are entering, the land of Canaan, is very different from the land of Egypt, uh, where you come from. Okay, the land of Egypt uh, it is irrigated. Okay, uh, by 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 water, by foot, because there was Nile, there was Nile, Nile River. So this land in Egypt they can be irrigated, so you can you can you can harvest, you can you can plant crops. 
But he says, he goes on to say, but the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of it is a land of mountains and valleys and drinks rain from heaven. Okay, just imagine the land of Israel, which is a which is a small piece of land. It's about 150 miles in length, okay, from down to Beersheba, uh, from London to Birmingham is 150, 140 miles. So you know about that size, and then the width is about you know 45 miles. So it's not a huge land. But it has a very uh, uh, variety of, of, of different uh, uh, geography. On the western side, you have a plain, coastal plain. In the middle, you have a mountainside, a hill, Judea mountain, Samaria mountain, Galilee uh, a mountain. And then on the eastern side, you have valleys, deep valley, Jordan valley. Okay. So in this small land, you have a various geography. Okay. Uh, and so it cannot really depend on the river. So the Bible said, it is a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. So this land in Israel, what you need is not, you know, it's not just to depend on the uh, river entirely. You need to look up to, to heaven because you really need rain to come. Whether it's a plain or valley or the mountain area, you need rain. You cannot depend on the river. So you look to God, you look to heaven for rain, for crops, for harvest. That's why the Bible talks about the early rain, the spring rain, and the autumn rain, because they are absolutely dependent on the rain. Okay? So the promise is God cares for, for you. The eyes of the Lord, uh, your God, is continually on, him, on you from the beginning of the year to its end. So God works for the good using good and bad in our lives. And that's what we see in Job's life. Yes, he was he was a tough, he was a very, very difficult. But in the latter part of his life, he was even more blessed, uh, twice more blessed uh, than his former life. God worked good in his uh, life. And then lastly, uh, here we see that God actually loved Job. I, you know, we may think it's, 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 that's a hard to believe, but God actually loved Job. God loves us quietly. The fact that God doesn't speak to you doesn't mean that God, God loves you less. God still loves us quietly and silently. There's a wonderful verse in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17. It says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. He will rejoice over you with singing. And in other translation, it says, He will quietly love you. He will quietly love you. Okay. He loves us uh, quietly. Uh, you know, he, he loves us sometimes, and he, he will speak to us. He will encourage us. He will send uh, comforting messages to us. So that's, that's one way of you know, showing his love for us. But then sometimes, he loves us quietly. There will be no words. Uh, you know, no, no messages particularly, but he, he still loves us. He will quietly loves us. And that's what Job experienced. He thought the God was distant, but God actually, God actually loved Job uh, so much. So in chapter chapter 42, in the last chapter, uh, and uh, it says in ver uh, ver uh, verse 7, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me. You know, God says, you know, you're, you're friends of Job. You try to talk to Job, but what you said was wrong. You have not spoken the truth. Uh, and then God says, verse 8, Now take seven bulls and rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. So God is saying, okay, pre prepare your, your animals, bulls and rams, okay? And then sacrifice. Uh, so I will accept your sacrifices, okay? But go to Job and sacrifice uh, there with him. And he will pray for you. He will pray for you. Uh, and then I will accept his prayer. Verse 9. The Lord accepted Job's prayer. Okay? Now, if you think about that, that's really interesting. Uh, a funny situation. Because the friends, they came from long distance. So that means you know, they, were, they were rich, they were wealthy, they, they were well to do people. They've got their means, they've got their transport, they have their money, you know, they've got nice dresses. So that's Job's friend. Job, on the other hand, he lost everything. No money, no property, no possession. 
and he's completely covered with this skin problem from top to toe, and he's uh, like the worst kind of homeless person. He, you know, he lost everything. Okay. But God is saying to, to, to his friend, now you go to Joel and ask him to pray for you. Okay. Now you think, you know, Job is to ask them to pray. You know, can you pray for me? I'm, I'm just, I've got nothing. I'm, I'm poor. You know, I'm homeless. I've got nothing. So can you please pray for me? You think that that would be, you know, the usual situation? But God is saying completely the other way around. You, the wealthy people, you are the well, well to do. Guys, you go to Job. Okay, you go to Job, the homeless guy. Uh, you know, the, the guy in the terrible situation, you go to Job and ask him to pray for you. I, I, um, I, can, I can understand Job's dilemma, uh, you know, a, a little bit. Okay, sometimes, sometimes I, I accompany Pastor Kim and uh, we, we, we visit, uh, you know, some, some church members' home. Uh, and, uh, and then we have, you know, we have business people, we have uh, like a director's of a company or branch. So, you know, we have some rich people in the church, okay, which, which is good. And uh, so they have nice houses, all paid by the company, you know, wonderful car, paid by the company, and they don't worry about, you know, rent or anything, you know, all paid by the company, okay. So they really enjoy luxury. So I, I, I come to visit this place and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling and, and then I see, wow, this is a wonderful, wonderful house, wonderful garden. Okay. And then I try to pray for them. Okay, we try to pray for them. And I feel like oh, God, this is this is not quite right. It doesn't feel quite right. It feels like I need their help. Okay, uh, but that's what God is saying here. You may you may have a no means. You may have very little or nothing here. Okay, you may be really struggling, and you may be in great pain and hardship. You you suffer. You you can't see you know way out. You're completely in, in dark darkness, okay? And then you see your friends, they are well to do. They, they think it's going on well, all right? They look blessed. But God is asking Job to pray for them. God is asking them to come to Job and receive prayer, okay? Materially, that's the case, but also spiritually. Sometimes you feel that, oh, you know, I haven't read the Bible for a while and I haven't, I haven't prayed, I haven't had a uh, quiet time, so I'm not really spiritually, you know, sharp at the moment, I'm not really filled with the Holy Spirit, so I'm not in a situation to minister to other people and maybe I need to receive, not in a position to, to help others. You may feel, you know, spiritually poor, okay? But then God can still use you. God can still use you, all right? And, uh, you know, I know that very, uh, uh, very well because sometimes I feel like God, I'm a bit empty, a bit dry, and I'm not ready to, to speak. I remember once, you know, many, many years ago, and I was completely dry. I was really dry, spiritually speaking. Okay, I, you know, I just hated going to church and speaking, uh, preaching on that Sunday. I just wanted to go somewhere. Uh, but then I had to, I had no choice. I came to church and I spoke. Okay, I think it was uh, Genesis chapter 11 or 12. I spoke. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was really empty. Uh, but I spoke. But after service was over, a lady, young lady came up to me and, and said, Pastor, thank you so much. What you just said in service was really, really helpful to me. I was really struggling. I was really trying to find an answer. And uh, God spoke to me through what you just said. And so thank you. And I was really amazed. I was humbled. I was humbled to realize God can still use me when I'm really struggling, when I'm like an empty, when I'm like a dry. Okay. God was able to use Job in this terrible, terrible situation. He used Job to pray for his friends and God accepted Job's uh, prayer. And so God may be silent uh, and, and God may not speak you know, to us sometimes. Uh, you may not get uh, what, 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 what you expect God to speak, uh, but God can still use you. God still works in our lives. And, and, and God can still use us and very much love us uh, in that kind of situation. When we read the Bible, uh, it's not only Job that experienced God's silence. You know, quite often we see God's silence. In Moses' life, for example, he tried to save the uh, Israelite at the age of 40. He thought he was clever. He was educated in the Egyptian palace. And uh, you know, he, he had all this martial arts skill. So he thought he was strong, he was clever, he was smart, and was trying to eat in his own strength, but he failed. He ended up becoming, becoming a murderer. He ran away to Midian Desert. And then the next chapter, uh, extra chapter uh, three, we see he, 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 you know, he, he, he encountered God in this burning bush, okay? So, you know, there's a chapter two, he runs away, and chapter three, he encounters God. But do you realize between chapter two and chapter three, there is a 40-year gap? 
It was a 40 year gap. There was nothing from God. And in that 40 year, Moses was doing just tending the sheep, you know, looking after the sheep, the animal in the desert. And in fact, the Egyptians, Egyptians really despised shepherding. Okay? So Moses was told not to do this kind of job. This is a this, this is terrible job. This is you know, the, the lowest kind of people will do this job. But Moses is doing that exactly that. The, the, the kind of job that he was taught to despise. He's doing that, looking after the animal. And for 40 years, there was no message. There was no words from God. But then, in, in, in one day, on one day, God speaks. Okay? And the history changed. So Moses experienced the silence of God for many, many years. Between Old Testament and New Testament, uh, in this period called Intertestamental Period, there was a 400 year period, no words from God, no messenger, no prophecy, no prophet, no book. Okay, God was silent. God was absolutely silent. And so at the end of Malachi, and, and before John the Baptist appears, there was silence for 400 years. Okay. But you know what? Even God was silent. God was actually preparing you know, amazing things. Okay. Uh, there was a, there was a, there was a Greek Empire, you know, Alexander Alexander the Great. So we don't see him in the Bible because he was in that period, silent period. We don't see him in the Bible. But uh, you know the Greek language spread across the across the uh, the Mediterranean. Okay, so that was the language to carry the message of the Bible later. Jesus, Paul, uh, and the, and then the other Greeks, the Romans came, and he, they they prepared all the all the road system. You know, all roads lead to Rome, and then they had a politically quite secure. Uh, system, Pax Romana. It was very secure, it was very safe for people to travel. That's why Jesus and disciples were able to travel quite safely. Judah and Galilee and Paul and his team, they traveled all around because of Pax Romana. Okay. So God made silent, but he actually worked, he prepared all these things so that the people of God uh, uh, can serve uh, and, 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 and God used them in an amazing way. Brothers and sisters, if you feel that God is silent for some reason, let's be reminded that God still loves us. He loves us quietly. He works for the good, using good and bad, and He limits the boundary, and He decides the boundary of our hardship, and uh, God is absolute control. God is in control. And we can tr still trust God, and we can still worship and thank God. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless us continually. Uh, so this is the last Sunday of July. Uh, and uh, in August, you know, I know that, uh, uh, for example, Linus will go to India and uh, we want to see him and the family for four weeks or so. Uh, you know, people go on holiday. And uh, But, you know, wherever you are, wherever you go, whatever plan you may have, may the Lord bless you uh, in a wonderful way so we can experience God's grace and God's blessing. Amen. 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 Would you like to all stand together, please? Let's, uh, let's sing a song. I think the 10,000 reasons, yes, that's good. By the way, this was a song sung by our team in the wedding, you know, in the wedding uh, yesterday. 10,000 reasons, the couple, they, 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 they sang this song and uh, just praising God and thanking God for everything that God has done. Let's sing this song and uh, praise God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Well, brothers and sisters, if you enjoy God's grace and God's goodness and uh, God's bounties in your life, that's fantastic. Praise God for that. We should praise God for that. But if you are experiencing, you know, kind of suffering, hardship, uh, struggle, okay, we can see Job. He sees his friends who are shiny, who have these sick dresses, uh, you know, shiny horses and donkeys, and uh, and they they all well to do. They you know they 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 rich and wealthy. And Job, on the other hand, he has nothing. God blessed his life later uh, twice as much, but this is before that happened. 
before the effort. Okay, so he's still very much in a in a in a rack, you know, beggar, uh, you know, homeless. Okay, but he 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 takes his trust. He puts his trust in God, and he prays for his friend. I like I like to imagine that picture. You know, he's he's thinking of me. You know, thinking of me. Yes, I'm homeless. I got nothing. I have no money. I have no children. They all gone. And even my wife left. And I'm terrible. You know, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I'm terrible situation. But God wants me to pray for my friends. And uh, oh my God, the uh, resides of the sacrifice of worship. So Job does that in obedience to God. In obedience to God, pray for his friends. And God accepted his prayer for them. You know, isn't that amazing? You know. God can use your prayer when you are when you are good, when things are going good in your life. But God can also use you when things are really bad. You know, when 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 absolute bankruptcy, He can still use us. And then later the Holy verse, and it says, and Job had prayed for his friends, and the Lord made him prosperous again, and gave him twice as much he had before, and her God's blessing surely came. And Job experienced that uh, in his life. Let's pray. Let's pray. Whatever situation we may be in, God is good. That's the bottom line. Absolute, fundamental truth. God is good. He's gracious. God. And let's pray that we can put our faith and trust in Him. Uh, and uh, even if He's a son, we know He loves us. And uh, so pray that uh, uh, you know, God, God, God bless uh, you know, in our journey, in our church ministry. And so we can serve Him continually. We can bring the good news in this community. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. We worship you. Thank you, Lord, that you do with us. That we are good. That we are strong. Heavenly Father, as we worship you this morning, I pray that you would pour out your grace on my brothers and sisters. God, thank you. You use us when we have a plenty, when we have a bountiful, and when we have enough, when we have much, you use us. Thank you, Lord. But also, you use us when we have nothing, when we have zero, when everything is gone, when we lost everything. And when, when we are in need, in fact, oh Lord, you still use us. You, you, you use us to be a blessing to others. Thank you, oh God. And uh, Lord, we pray that we can swim in your grace, in, in this summer, we can really enjoy your grace, enjoy your goodness, be assured of your love, your, your unconditional love, your guidance, your provision, your care, your protection. Lord, wherever we go, whatever we do, during this summer month, we pray that we can be really absolutely sure and to put our trust in you. Thank you, Lord. Let we start a new week. Uh, bless our, our brothers and sisters so we can have a fantastic uh, week. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. Amen. Amen.